Welcome to the six part series with Carmen Medina. Carmen is a former CIA Deputy Intelligence Director, author, and consultant. Carmen is a thinker and hopes to popularize better thinking. We both feel that philosophy and thinking better are an ideal pairing. And we hope you enjoy this fun, natural conversation. The intention was to try and get behind, you know, the perception of what Carmen is in the workplace. How do your co- your your colleagues, and 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 how do your clients, and how do your, uh, y- you know, your past team members uh, at the CIA? How how would they describe Carmen just in general? Your personality. Well, the first thing everyone says about me is that I'm really creative, hmm. which can be a curse. Because there's a lot of things that go or that people attach to the concept of a creative person that aren't necessarily that useful or welcomed in organizations. Uh, So a creative person can be impulsive, for example, and that's something that organizations have a hard time with. But in any case, I think creative is the very first thing that uh, comes to mind when people think of me as a team member, someone who's always going to come up with lots of ideas, not always welcomed at the time, because maybe their perception is that we need to buckle down and execute whatever task is in front of us. And the last thing we need is another idea. Let's just take the ones we have and complete the task. I, I know in my Myers-Briggs test, I come out as a, whether you believe in it or not, but I believe in this case, this is very true. I come out as a very strong P, which means that I, I don't seek closure early. In fact, compared to almost everyone else, I'm much more willing to let things ride and sort of let ideas marinate, and situations marinate so that you have a better sense of that you're doing the right thing. I think... Um, People perceive me as kind and a people person. I was, I think the two things that motivate me at work are big ideas and people. I was recently doing a session with some former colleagues of mine and two of them came up to me and mentioned something I had done around them that had made a big impact on them that, you know, I, I don't really remember. So for example, when I was uh, a senior leader at CIA, I made a point of wishing everyone personally happy birthday on their birthday by sending them an instant message. We had a, you know, same time messaging system on the uh, agency computer network. And this one person said, I can't tell you how much that meant to me because they were just starting out and they got this message from me. And someone else told a different story of how I, during a task force where people, it's kind of like all hands on deck to deal with a crisis in the world. She was stunned to find me there serving on the task force, even though at that time I was very senior, way beyond whatever level you would be to serve on a task force. And she said, that impressed me so much. This was a really such a heartwarming story that when I found myself in a similar position of influence, I would take the smallest cubicle in the least favorable part of the office just to set the example for how generous we were supposed to be as teammates. So I think that I think those are, you know, generally positive, creative, spontaneous, kind. I think uh, if you, they know me well enough, at some point they'll be disappointed because I'm I'm lazy. I'm particularly lazy about details. Um, they they they're just not compelling for me. I was actually mentioning this at the same event where I was talking to former colleagues. And I'm going to steal this phrase forever. One of them said, oh, well, oh, yes, at work, they accused me of being strategically lazy. And I thought, "Ah, that's fantastic. That is indeed what I am as well. And, (laughs) And, you know, when you're a manager, 
<clears throat> or even if you're a, a, a member of a team, if you think you know how things are need to be done, there's a tendency for people to just step right in and do it. And one element of strategic laziness is no, even if you know you could do it twice as fast as the other person, step back, provided, you know, there's no issue in terms of mission impact and let the other person do it because then they have a significant learning experience. So I think strategic laziness is a wonderful habit to cultivate at work. There, there's a very interesting dynamic that you're representing. I think you're pulling this into into the uh, into the Rebel at Work brand, possibly. But yes, yes, um, that's fascinating to me. That the uh, you know behind the curtain, whatever curtain it is at the CIA, um, the, that 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 there's this. Uh, I would say it is a positive dynamic, right? I mm -hmm. mean, uh, there's this emergent. Um, uh, group dynamic that 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 makes the group of people at and within the CIA very much like groups uh, everywhere else. You know, there's some shared characteristics that we can absolutely. Talk about. I mean, uh, there's just this horrible misconception that people have of the CIA, in part encouraged by the CIA itself. I think the public relations people kind of like it when we seem to be. Oh, you know, on the cusp of being superheroes. Uh, and certainly a lot of people that hate the CIA uh, will characterize us as having no values of any significance, no moral barometer of, of any kind. And the CIA is, is really just a large organization with a uh, a unique mission, but even though the mission is unique, there are other organizations that have a similar type of mission. In the literature, people talk about high performance, high reliability organizations. These are organizations that have to do something very difficult at, uh, in other words, another phrase is high risk, high performance organizations. They have to do something quite difficult uh, where the risk of failure is not really tolerated. And yet there is built into what they do, risk of failure. So medicine, aviation, for example, uh, and I would say the intelligence community has that type of, falls in that category. And uh, people then, I think, falsely jump to the assumption that, well, they have to be different kinds of people to do that kind of work, right? They, they, they can't have the same human dynamic and that's not the case at all. We're just, we're just normal people with normal, we, we hire, you know, for, we hire for talent. Uh, we, we compete with the state department and in many, uh, uh, NGOs, international NGOs uh, for talent. So someone that's work that's applying at the CIA could also be applying to be a foreign, so foreign service officer and to work for the World Bank hmm. or uh, Amnesty International even. And wow. so therefore you, we are the, you know, that's the, that's how you should think of us, not as whatever you've received from media. Just a quick question: Are they? But is it is it is it um, specific to U.S. citizens? Yes, it has to be. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes no, sense. That that that's you know that's seems that, like a silly question, but I I don't spend no, much time absolutely. thinking about yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's really fascinating. Um, now you've been retired from the CIA for a number of years. Uh, yes. when, when, when did you, when was your retirement? I retired in 2010. So it's all in February of 2010. So it's almost 12 years now. Hmm. And I think that, you know, <laughs> I laughingly say, but truthfully that one of my goals is uh, post CIA is that when I die, that the obituary will not say former CIA Mm. Uh, person, because that's just the default that everybody goes to. I, I, I don't think I'm going to accomplish it. But uh, yeah, it's been that long. And although I keep thinking my understanding of it and uh, 
is dated uh, every time I meet with former colleagues or who are still working there, I, I realize that there's a lot of continuity in the issues. Be- and that's because, you know, all large organizations have the same issues. And one of the revelations for me when I left CIA was that a lot of the things that I thought were uniquely CIA pathologies were actually patho- just, just what I now refer to as large organizational disease. You know, it's just something that is unavoidable once you become a large organization. Right. Do you feel that there's a benefit to small groups in terms of like how, how if, if you're trying to be creative, uh, attack a novel problem, um, is, is there any uh, general rules of thumb, uh, working heuristics, I guess, uh, in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, small group dynamics or, you know, how, how do you battle the, the inherent bureaucracy that just starts to fill right. a large organization? Right. Yeah. Well, sort of at, to uh, level set on answering that question, I think that one of the th- values that large organizations have, they don't always realize it, they don't always articulate it. Some do, is that they want things to run smoothly. They want, they don't want pertur- perturbations right? They want smooth operations. The reason why they want that, I think, is that large large organizations are designed, they're created to deliver value at scale. Whatever that value proposition is for them, they want to deliver it consistently at scale. So they want smoothness. So now you're a small team and you you bring that value of smoothness now down to the unit, and what you get then is little tolerance for deviation from whatever the orthodoxy is of the organization. Uh, often, little tolerance for a broader spectrum of human personality and talent uh, than uh, than you should have. And then all of those things, I believe, reduce your diversity of thought, which I think is an essential component of successful teams. When I, when I talk to uh, people that are in the human capital talent management field, I, I say to them, you know, I think the future of, of talent management human capital is to figure out ways that we can understand how to combine talent in the most optimum way, given the particular task this talent has to do or solve, problem it has to solve. So historically, when I worked in government, and I still think it's the case, you have a difficult issue that you're tackling, let's say Iran, and uh, or let's talk about a new issue that's you know, some new issue that that's come up that, you know, a part of the world that has been uh, very uh, quiet all of a sudden flares up and you have to assemble talent to do that. You, you don't really think about anything other than where are the available warm bodies, right? You know, you don't, I, I've yet really to meet anyone that goes, okay, we need someone who's, uh, you know, very good at, at, uh, uh, writing. We need someone who's very good in uh, the social cultural norms. We need we need someone who's a really good knitter who can really knit different people together, kind of the facilitator person. And you could name 10, 12 archetypes of people that you need on the team. And then we also need different types of thinking. You know, there are different cognitive styles styles and approaches. We can start with the now discredited left brain, right brain. Mm-hmm. You know, we can go Daniel Kahneman, system one, system two. Right. Yeah. We can do like good verbally, you know, bad with math or good spatially, but uh, bad in pattern recognition. There's just this whole grab bag of thinking styles. And now we're talking about neurodivergent, you know, the entire uh, uh, spectrum, right, Mm -hmm. 
of different types of thinking styles. And I don't know that anybody has, it, I'm sure somebody is doing good work on this, but I don't think anyone has really figured out some reliable heuristics, rules of thumb that you can use to put people together to, um, prof, you know, to, so that you have a better chance of, of succeeding at your task. Hmm. And then uh, there's a guy that I'll, I'm not going to say his name, but he's an anthropologist who works with NASA. Okay. And I served on a committee once with him. And I can I can probably dig it up and, and find his name. But he told me he does a lot of work studying teams in Antarctica. Hmm. Because there's a situation where if you don't get the team right, you're stuck with them for six months, usually, in, in Antarctica. And he... Uh, one of the things that just tickled me when he told me is that one of the keys to a successful team is that you have to have a team comedian, you know, the, 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 the guy or the gal that, that cuts through the tension and makes people laugh and that successful, really successful teams, particularly in really difficult situations tend to laugh, you know, tend to have someone that helps them relax under stress. So mm. I think this question of successful team composition is the future of human capital, uh, probably the future of leadership. Because frankly, I think that if you if you put the team together correctly, the manager has much less leader slash leader has much less to do. Thank goodness, you know, and can return to being strategically lazy, right? Mm. So you know. That's fascinating. Like it, 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 it pulls me in a different direction. It, 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 it moves against some of my intuitions that gravitate towards a meritocracy. Yes. Right? I mean, yeah. Um, and, and if, and if I value and I self-reflect on, on where I spend my time, how I, uh, you know, consistently, you know, read and learn up on, learn about things and, and, and self-study. Right. Um, there's, probably an inherent bias towards, you know, people that can grasp those kinds of concepts. Right. And yet that's not uh, an ideal group dynamic is uh, yeah, right. if I'm understanding it correctly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things I say uh, when I'm talking to people about being a successful rebel at work, a successful change agent, uh, people that are rebels at work that have that kind of visionary ability can see the new coming at them before other people see it. Uh, tend, like me, not to be real detail mavens. And as a result, tend to be dismissive of people who we call, whom we call uh, bureaucratic black belts. Mm -hmm. These are the people that sort of own all the details and rules in the organization and sort of they make their career by mastering all these things. They're the kind of the they're kind of the gatekeepers of the organizational norms. And I when I was doing some of my uh, innovative stuff at CIA, I at one point came across a problem that was, you know, stood a chance of derailing the progress we had made to date and uh, found out that this woman whom I knew but had never really brought into my inner circle because I just, you know, I just thought she was a boring detail person and she didn't, she didn't trade in the ideas that I traded in. I bring this woman in and she, not only does she know the answer and can solve this problem for us, but she had lots of contributions to make. Hmm. Things that I had not paid attention to, but, but were important that she had the ability to uh, prevent us from falling into other problem areas. And so that's where I, uh, I learned. And the, the lesson I say is that you have to embrace your bu bureaucratic black belts. Mm. And, you know, people, we tend to run away from them, but I think they, they can actually strengthen your uh, change efforts. That's really interesting. Uh, on, a, on a little bit of a, a, a side note, do you yeah. have much thought uh, or have you spent much time thinking about education systems? Uh not a lot, you know, so I, I have friends that uh, that do a lot of education work. And uh, all I know is that there's just a huge conflict right now in education uh, between people who believe 
as I understand it, that you need to be taught how to think and how to learn. You that the, the goal is to teach you to be a learner. Mm-hmm. And the other side are people that, you know, feel there's a more disciplined body of knowledge that everyone has to know. And if they don't know it, then they're not going to become productive members of society. Yeah, there and, was a yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, and I'm more in the former camp. But mm-hmm. that said, whenever as I think you and your listeners uh, are, would be the same, that whenever I come across a topic that fascinates me, then I, I will go way deep into it to make sure I understand it, right? I think when you get into problems is trying to make people experts on things that they just don't have any affinity for. It's really hard to learn and mm. retain if you don't care. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a, a a fairly popular podcast uh, called The Dark Horse, and this is with two evolutionary biologists. Uh, I've Brett heard Weinstein. of that before. Yep. Yep. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. So um, they're very they're progressive, and you know, self identifying as liberals. Just to give the context, um, right. they're they're a wonderful group uh, or couple. Um, I, I I don't necessarily agree with everything which would be you know kind of a a, a sign of somebody that 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 has a, a, a some good crit- critical thinking capabilities yeah. but um the reason why i bring them up is that i th- i think they're 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 trying to um move towards non-standard pedagogical systems mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. they're trying to emphasize things that are are not the standard and I, I think I think this is very valuable um, from an evolutionary standpoint. They frame it somewhat like this: that the the purpose of the education system um, is is to augment some of our learning. I mean, we have na- some natural language abilities, right? right? Which is, um, by the way, a mystery to me. Oh yes, it's a fascinating it's, one. I don't know it? if yeah. you know, like the fact that. Babies pop out of the womb ready to learn and with no net, you know, need, no need to up, upload new software, right? Or upgrade their software. Their little package is ready to go. Yeah. And then off they go, right? And, you know, the, solving that mystery is the key, I think, or uh, to uh, uh, developing artificial intelligence that is truly human in its capability because if if artificial i mean artificial intelligence has to be able at some point to learn by itself without any other modification although that will be scary when that happens uh i have to you you've tantalized me so much with <laughs> the with the the introduction of ai so um and i have something that will challenge your intuition so i'm hoping okay. the little hairs on the back of your neck go up here so. oh okay <laughs> so um, I have a book uh, that I haven't published yet. It's called Will Freeman, and it's an artificial intelligence book. Mm-hmm. Now, the premise of the book is um, to counterpoint the fear that you have about artificial intelligence, because I think there's um, there's plenty of that to go around, right? I mean, uh, in everything from a Terminator narrative of the machines taking over to like it, it, it is, and it comes with this this scariness factor. Right. And um, from uh, a novel standpoint, a literary fiction, it's a you know as a philosopher, I'm taking a more deliberate approach to the use of fiction to you know to talk about some some deep topics. Right. Um, and the 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 arc of the book basically is that humanity is heading towards a uh, an expiration date, a known mm, expiration right. date. Yeah. And so now, what humanity is left with is is to try and embody right the uh, the collective wisdom. And the character main character's name is Sophia. Um, we're trying to embody the collective wisdom for the future right. right knowing that the um the the biological phylogenetic chain is actually coming to a halt but right. It, it, we, right. we know without 
with a a hundred percent certainty that that is mathematically that's going to happen. Right. right. Now, of course, there's a few holdouts, but generally everybody. It's interesting to think whether or not that's actually in our genetic makeup right now, whether whether or not that's even a possibility. And I think that's the idea here that yeah. novels do kind of pull on those uh, right. strings a little bit. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they get you to think about well, maybe the technology, maybe technology is not um, is as uh, as bad as we think. Um, I, I mean, I'm all for governing, right? To use that term loosely. Uh, that just means slowing down the throttle of increase towards uh, technology. Mm-hmm. But I think we, um, I, I, I use this in a, um, in, in a, it, by way to illustrate, if you, if you were to think about where the human civilization is actually going to be in 500 years, right? that's something that we can somewhat abstract and, and, and right. kind of extrapolate, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In, in 5,000 years, no. oh, starts yeah. to get a little blurrier. Right. 50,000 years. Oh, my God, yes. Would, would we even recognize ourselves exactly. if we were half, uh, like, uh, exactly. mechanical or augmented? And I say this as we, like, a, a little bit of a poetic flourish, like helo, heliotropic plants mm-hmm. bend earthward towards mm-hmm. the divisive nature of our... Mm-hmm. Of mm-hmm. our entities, right? These mm-hmm. these devices that we 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 pack around. Yeah. So, um, I'm I'm much more. Um, I'd like to bring a, a comparison here and say that I'm much. Uh, I think like you in this case, where I'm much more open to let those types of things ruminate, let right. those ideas kind of percolate, and right. then see what comes out and emerges out of that. That exactly that right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a. Are you familiar with the book that came out maybe ten years ago, the history of the future in one hundred objects? Oh, uh, it was based on a BBC series, a history of the world in one hundred objects. Well, oh. this, <laughs> which I, I have actually never seen, but. Then uh, some, uh, you know, very interesting. I, I can't think of his name right now, but he's a uh, owns a gaming company in England and but trained in Cambridge on neuroscience. Uh, so he wrote this book pretending it's 2087, something like that, and describing how we got to where we are today through a hundred objects. Right. Things right that that capture this journey. And uh, uh, I will I won't uh, I don't think I'll spoil it by telling you this because the book really can be read as individual little chapters because each each chapter is about one of the things. But at the end, they're all waiting for like some zero day thing that's going to happen. They realize that that at some point in the last uh, 50 years to solve some kind of cyber security disaster worldwide, the company or whatever that they hired injected some kind of Trojan into the system and they don't know what it's going to do, but they know it's going to, or they assume it's going to be really bad. And, and that's, that's kind of like the end of, yeah. of his account, you know? And, uh, but I liked, I liked very much what the author did there because I, and I think one of the problems with a lot of thinking is that it deals too often in adjectives and adverbs. And I think thinking generally is better when we are using noun, nouns and verbs, you know, actions and things. And I think he disciplined, I, I imagine in writing the book, he disciplined himself into personifying all these ideas that he had into an actual thing. Mm -hmm. or an actual activity that happened and i it's a it's a very good book about about really at this point the near future and many of the things i remember reading there already started to happen basically so as a side note it's it's almost serendipitous here because uh my my fellow co-host for a different series scott heffler he's uh uh he's a con scholar Uh uh-huh um, and he and I have actually done a Bernowski series, a Charles Bernowski series. Oh, yeah. 
And so we follow that series from the 70s. Still amazing, uh, Bernowski. And then there's The Day the Universe Changed with, changed with James Burke. Mm. And so we're doing both of those series. And I think the series that you're talking about is coming up next for us. Okay. It's, it's interesting right. how we, you know, we go back almost 50 years and we're exploring some of these real... Yeah. Right. And important BBC, uh, yes. you know, productions. Yeah. That's, that's, right. that's 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 quite fascinating. Like, what would you describe your your biggest benefits from the CIA in terms of working with groups? You know, interesting. There's a lot of people. We hired a lot of people after 9/11. It was a big explosion, and uh, many of them have left for any number of reasons. Some are disappointed at the rate at which the uh, CIA is advancing along sort of, you know, modern technology or some just, you know, got tired of bureaucracy. But when you talk to them, they all say that a CIA trained person has tremendous uh, advantages in in the uh, modern economy. And I think what they're taught is a they're taught to be good thinkers at the uh, in the best cases they're taught to be non-judgmental extremely open-minded learners and uh, connectors of disparate ideas so I think that's a key skill and when we don't have it, and we often don't have it, that's when we get blindsided by change. Because change happens when issue one, issue 29, issue 47, and issue 562 combine in a way to create something emergent, new, frightening, delightful, whatever, that we never saw coming. Mm. And like uh, TikTok. You know, I, I was on TikTok for a little while. Uh, I thought it was fun, but I, I haven't been back in six months. And I, from reading, I get the impression all sorts of new sorts of things are happening on TikTok. That people are using it in, in, in ways that we just couldn't imagine. So I think this ability to connect disparate threads and have some way of thinking about how they might combine in the future mm. is uh, uh, at its best is what a CIA analytic thinker can do. Mm. Uh, I don't even know if 10% of our, of our analysts reach that level. Wow. Um, because it's so hard, right? Yeah, yeah. They're all, the good ones are all traveling along that road and, and trying to improve their skills in that way. Right. And I, I wish, I mean, I, I'm somebody that uh, has an entrepreneur background turned mm -hmm. philosopher. Okay. Right. Um, and so what I find as I start to uh, build my media company, right. build my publishing company, uh, that I am trying to bring a diverse group of, imagine trying to work with academics like I do. Right. Uh, right. Carmen, I will tell you, <laughs> it's somewhat like herding cats. Oh, yes. Very so, much so. But so now, and some disciplines are different than others. Now, I want to mm -hmm. give you a little bit of a preview for how I'd like to wrap up uh, this episode. Okay. And 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 then and then I'm going to get into my next my next point, which will start to get a little bit heavy. Okay. Okay. But I I I want you to think and ruminate about um, the sidecar information or legacy that. Uh, that that could be Carmen's legacy, okay? And and you mentioned a point that oh goodness, on my epitaph, it, it's going to have something related to the CIA, right? Right, probably. But I but I challenge you to think about this for a minute. And I think, what about philosophy? A philosopher, um, possibly even co-writing a book together. Now, right, right. I want to plant that seed because I'm going to. Um, I think the very moment or instant where I said, I want to talk to her. Yes. Okay. And, and what I thought was very fascinating is that many of the topics that, that you're talking about are topics that philosophers either directly talk about or um, kind of tangentially talk about. Right, right, right. right? And 
I see a, a contribution there because mm -hmm. in a very simplistic summary to kind of give you the, you know, the, the heuristic summary of what this would mean is that your experience is almost like practical philosophy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in the body of philosophy, there's, uh, you know, the entire field of knowledge. Right. right? You and, know, I had, I, yeah, I had that same thought as I was just thinking briefly about this call. And I, you know, what I did in my career was in many ways try to, uh, uh, was in many ways influenced by philosophy, what I had learned, because I think I told you I took lots of philosophy in college uh, because I had to, but but I loved it. And I continue to read philosophy. Right now I'm uh, reading a biography of Kierkegaard. Uh, oh. I forget. It, was, it came out a few years ago and it was a very uh, well-known biography. Um, forget what the, the name of it is. But in any case, I, I do think that, you, that I had the same thought, that much of what I have done in my career, when I did things that were, if you think about it in a more abstract way, was I was trying to implement some sound philosophical concepts, starting with Socrates, smartest person is the one who knows that they don't know everything. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, vulgarized there. But starting from there forward, uh, and, you know, Aristotle, that I think had a, uh, a desire to kind of organize knowledge and put things into categories. And so categorization has also been a big part of how I've approached analytic thinking. And, and, and if you think about what I would like to be known for, I would, I think I would like to be known for popularizing good thinking, you know, to help, particularly given where we are as, as a human race right now in our society, uh, where literally with the internet, we opened Pandora's box to trade in a cliche and have allowed people with very bad thinking skills access to dubious pools of knowledge that can, you know, create, creates mayhem. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, I would love to be able to popularize. And, and you know, you know, I, it would be great if a book on how to think better was something that people read, you know, the, right. a, the average person read. Right. I mean, I like Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, but, the average person did not read that book, even though it was remarkably successful for that kind of book. Ah, so you, okay. Uh, and, and so what I'll say is that no promises to the listeners. We've just started to, you know, talk about this. Right, um, right. And, and Carmen and I will, I think, ruminate over this, over the, the six mm -hmm. episodes. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a project together or maybe not. I've just brought it up. Sounds like we're somewhat on the same page about a possibility, but right. let's just leave it like that Absolutely. for now. Yeah. Um, my direction on a, uh, on, on a, on book choice, I guess would be, um, I, I think the Kahneman book is more of the lame. So here's just where I'm coming at it in yeah, terms right. of understanding. So, um, to me, the, the, the Kahneman style book is the answer from the academic to give something to a broader speaking audience. That's right because I tend to give that broader speaking audience more um, credit than um, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, the book publishers or the right. authors when we think about trying to actually write uh, a book for a group. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do at PlankSip is I encourage people to write. And I say, one of the first things that we want to do with young emerging writers is you've heard the cliche of, of trying to find your writer's voice. And I think that finding your voice first and trying to communicate either in super complex language mm -hmm. or very simple language is really your MO first, mm -hmm. right? Is to get the idea down in the most um, understandable uh, format to you first and foremost. Right. right. Um, and then from there, um, you can look at editing it or modifying it in a way that that makes it either more digestible. But I think with 
the the further you go out in distance away from whatever you produce as your intellectual thought, the the more it um, can dilute and right. I get that be misinterpreted. Right? Yeah. It's hard. To, it's hard to be super vague sometimes. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I think you and I are actually already both um, generalists and generalists. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, to go back to that dark horse podcast with Hang and and Weinstein. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a function for generalists in society, and that's really to bring um, groups together. And I and I think with the progression of our modern condition, right. we're seeing a lot of isolated. You call it the uh, spotlight effect in in other, yeah, uh, yeah. which I'm going to get you to talk about in a minute. Um, we have we 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 move towards. Uh, specialization, and it seems to me in the higher educational uh, worlds, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of interdisciplinary studies. Now mm-hmm. they're completely underfunded, but the idea is that we they know we have to work together. They know right. that we have to have you know these these categories that we've established. We need to be able to have them you know work together in a more conciliant uh, uh, a way. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Right. So, yeah, why don't we why don't we talk about um, the spotlight effect first? And then my my favorite example, and I'll let you kind of carry both of these, the spotlight effect. And then please tell us that story about I think it was in Afghanistan or Iraq when you advised or your team had advised their administration of a worst case scenario. And I think you know the the beauty of that example. Right. right, Go ahead. Well, uh, so uh, the spotlight, or I, I often think of it as the streetlight effect, is this idea that, uh, well, not idea, but it's uh, the importance of understanding the, your inf- the, uh, the limits of the information that you are able to study. So at CIA, we had these computer profiles that delivered to our computers every morning, a reading list of hundreds of documents that pertain to our account. And I have to say it was well, you know, in the last 10 years of my career, when I had this epiphany and I went, oh my God, I treat this flow of information as if it was the totality of the information that I needed to know. But in fact, it is only a, a some part of the information that is available And in fact, uh, I don't even know what percentage of available information it represents. And the reason I call it the spotlight or the streetlight effect is there's an old joke about a drunk on his hands and knees under a streetlight looking for something. And a policeman stops by and says, what's what are you looking for? And the person says, my car keys. And the policeman says, is this where you lost them? And the person says, no, but this is the only place I can see. (laughs) <laughs> and that is how we do uh, 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 in a lot of fields, you know, medis- medicine, all science, all sorts of fields. You have, and I'm sure there's a very uh, specialized term for this in, in philosophy, but you have this problem where you assume that what you know represents everything that is knowable. And it rarely does. And I would, uh, when I work, talk with analysts, I would go in and we'd be in an auditorium and I'd say, okay, imagine that you're God, you're omniscient being, and you know everything there is to know about Al-Qaeda. You know everything, past, present, future. What in this large room represents what we know? And that was a really sobering question for them. And they would, you could see, you know, their eyes and then people would volunteer the cup that I'm owning. Or maybe they'd say two chairs, right? So once you ask them that question, it's like they, it's like they sobered up and they, you know, they went, "Oh my God, you're right. I don't even know what I don't know." So, yeah. you know, kudos to Donald Rumsfeld for uh, popularizing uh, some of these concepts. Uh, so that's on uh, the streetlight spotlight effect. So when. Warning is the classic problem for the intelligence community. If our job must first and foremost be about warning policymakers of an impending problem with the world or with the policies they're pursuing. 
And I remember when, uh, in this case, Iraq went badly, uh, conversations that we had with policymakers, uh, and they were very upset. And they said, you didn't warn us that this could happen. And we said, yes, we did warn you and reminded them of the material. And the policymaker goes, oh, yeah, but you said that was a worst case scenario. What an aha moment for me. I was like, oh, shit. As soon as we describe something as worst case scenario, most policymakers in love with their own expertise and uh, policy choices will dismiss it and say, oh, that's that means unlikely. So there's this tendency to conflate worst case scenario with unlikely. And, you know, a corollary would be best case scenario with what's going to happen. Right. And I, you know, I uh, that was one of the biggest lessons I had in my career. And I've talked to people about this. And, you know, one one person says, you know, we never say worst case scenario any longer. We just say most dangerous scenario. And of course, the policymaker is still going to ask you to give them odds. And I think what's really hard and just and this is related to the spotlight streetlight effect your ability to determine the odds for something happening or not happening is determined by how much you know. And you don't know everything, right? So therefore, any odds that you uh, cite are going to be imperfect, if not wrong. So those are those are two of the biggest uh, Thinking yeah, yeah. analytic lessons I learned in my career, and uh, and both of them, sadly, in the last ten years. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, yeah, it's 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 a tough thinking is a tough job. Yeah, executing yeah. executing is easy. Thinking is the hard part. So I got a I got a I have a a potential name for our uh, theoretical uh-huh. potential book here. Yeah. So the null hypothesis. Oh, the null, yeah. And and so the reason is, is that, um, you know, there is no significance between these two, you mm-hmm. know, these two isolated items. It's, t- it's right. statistically irrelevant and it's, right, it, right. it goes to infinity. Um, so now we want to really start thinking creative here for a minute. And I'm, and I'm curious if a, uh, uh, how would you, would, how would you approach this? If, if I took a rather arbitrary uh, uh, structure of data and started to populate it, mm-hmm. not looking for causal uh, uh, connections, but looking for relational connections. Mm-hmm. Okay, does this um, hold any relevance to uh, you know some of, some of the approaches that you hold? I'm not exactly sure I understand. Uh, okay, you know that's fair. What what you're saying? I mean, in some of the uh, some of the some of my approaches. So do I think it's like part of the same problems that, that I've, that I've mm-hmm. observed in my career? I'm so, actually, I'm trying to go into more of a, a solutions based approach because okay. if, if we're trying to look at, um, you know, the, the, like framing the theme for a book and, right. you know, yeah. use the working title that we may dismiss later, but yeah. you know, we call it the null hypothesis. So right. we're saying fundamentally right out of the gate that we want to be really, um, aware of, you know, the, the uh, correlation does not uh, mean causation. Right? Right. This is, yeah. you know, one of the foundational types of things. Right. But I think, so, so how do we work with uh, large uh, data sets in a predictive way that um, is still meaningful and still, mm-hmm. you know, so we're, we're talking about um, not trying to form a substrate of uh, what we know, but trying to gather information in an objective way and then still try and um, use that data in ways that we can um, offer some predicted, uh, you know, some right. predictable insights, right? This is yeah. kind of the idea. I will, I will say that you're, you're reminding me of something I talk about, which is analytic landscapes is an idea I tried to introduce uh, at, at the agency. And is the idea that we would often go off to try to solve whatever problem we were trying to solve 
without first doing a meta-analysis of our information space, and to the best of our ability, always imperfect, to understand all the categories of information that pertain, let's say China, everything that we need to know about China to understand its development in an abstract way, and then understand how accurate or how adequate is the information we have on each of these categories right now. So first, of course, you have to have a theory of what is adequate knowledge. I mean, <laughs> what is an adequate body of knowledge look like? And um, I, don't, I think that's a tough one because first, I guess you would have to find a body of, lo- of knowledge that we are quite confident is complete. Hmm. So what, you know, in the human um, experience, what do we understand completely at this point? Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what we understand completely. uh, No, so you would think you would nominate agriculture because that's what we've been doing the longest, right? You know, growing food and and things like that. But I think, you know, one of my favorite shows, I don't watch a whole lot of television. One of my favorite shows is one here local in the Washington area called Maryland Farm and Harvest. It's great. They go to all the local farms talk to people about what they do concretely. Mm -hmm. And they're constantly uh, sharing new farming methods that people are discovering, you know, oh, you don't need dirt. You can just grow them water, right? As long as there's enough nutrients, right? Farmers who are combining fish farming with vegetable farming and growing the vegetables in the water that the fish live in. You know, and, and and very successful. So, I would say, and, and this uh, now I'm going to get a little deep here, but I just had this thought. This gives you some idea of what it must be like to be an om- omniscient being. You know how staggering the concept of omniscience is, because an entity that knows everything that could ever be known. It's not just that they know everything that is known now, but they actually know everything that could ever be known. It's what a concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got a hard stop. And I think we should pick this up again in the next episode where we talk about analytical uh, landscapes. Okay. Possibly talk about uh, omniscient beings. Yes. Or the concept of. Um, So I'm excited. uh, And thank you very much for spending the time with us. Thank you, Daniel. So 